Today on CityCast DC, the plan to move DC's hockey and basketball teams to Virginia is one of the biggest stories of the year. It's one that's potentially devastating to downtown DC, and it's one that has led to all kinds of recriminations in local politics. The Washington Post just published a big behind-the-scenes look at how the decision went down. Reporter Sam Fortier is here to tell us all about it. Oh, and after the interview, CityCast CEO David Plotz will be joining us for a conversation sponsored by Urban Pace Real Estate about some rare new construction on Capitol Hill that you could get in on. Stick around to learn more. Today is Thursday, February 22nd. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Hey, Sam. Hey, thanks for having me. So you guys published like an old school TikTok of what happened. It opens up in Ted Leonsis' office with the mayor talking to him. Uh, They couldn't come to an agreement about the arena. So these guys used to have a good relationship. And your reporting shows how far it deteriorated. You know, literally, she goes in there thinking she's pitching him and she realizes mid-meeting that actually he's given her a heads up that tomorrow... He's going to announce his plans to leave. So how did you guys uncover these juicy details? This was a really intense collaborative effort between like five of my colleagues, Jonathan O'Connell, Teo Armas, Megan Flynn, Laura Vozela, and Gregory Schneider. I mean, Teo Armas and I were the people that were covering the announcement the day that it happened. And after we had sorted through the debris, it was right around Christmas time, we had a meeting And we just said, hey, we need to figure out like how this happened, because, you know, one of the frames of reference for their relationship between the mayor and Ted Leonsis was when they opened, you know, when they announced ESA in in Southeast and he gives her a peck on the cheek and he says we have one of the most dynamic mayors in the country. And in June, myself and a couple other Post reporters had written about there were tensions between SportsZone and the mayor because, you know, obviously Nats Park needed upgrades and and they were jockeying for funds and Monumental was as well. They were concerned about the commanders and and the way that the mayor was talking about that. But we said, hey, we need to really figure out like blow by blow, how did this thing happen? And so it was a really intense but fun and challenging two months of reporting. Walk us through what factors were weighing on Leonsis while he's thinking through his options. There's been a lot of talk about the noise uh, around the existing arena and gallery place and about crime around there. Yeah. So in 2016, Ted Leonsis says he's, quote, never going to leave the city. And like when Dan Snyder said he was, quote, never going to change the NFL team's name, never didn't really mean never. (laughs) I would say that after 2016, a lot of factors, crime, noise, the fallout from COVID, the mayor talking about the commanders and him not feeling like he was, quote, at the top of the stack, which is what he told us. Tell us about the fruit basket. (laughs) That was one of my favorite tidbits in your piece. Yes, it was incredible. Uh, The reporting process on that was particularly challenging. But basically, Ted Leonsis, in the owner's box at one of his games, complains that the mayor is doing all these things for Josh Harris to try to attract him, doing things for the Nats. And he quote, couldn't even get a fruit basket, unquote. And so the mayor's office uh, gets wind of that and they send him not a fruit basket, but a gift box with some coasters and some candles with DC logos. So I would say a lot of those things, not feeling appreciated, probably chief among them. Those are context for his thinking, but that's ultimately not what is a primary motivator for him to leave the city. I think even though he says money is not a big deal, I think it really comes down to money and what he would call his vision for the future. I think those are the two things that ultimately lead him to say, okay, Virginia is the place that I'm going to be. So the money piece was, he's got this arena, it's 25 years old or so. They want to do some improvements uh, to it because you know the other hockey and basketball arenas have, have new bells and whistles. And uh, they want the city to help them pay for it. The city has this cap on how much it'll borrow. And it's kind of at the cap. So they're like, we're not sure we can help you. What did they want? Did DC just say no or what happened? So this really starts in early 2022 when 
monumental and the former deputy mayor, John Felcicchio, start talking about, hey, what do we want to do here? And there's three different plans, partial renovation, full renovation, and new build. And so ultimately, they settle on the $800 million full renovation, kind of the middle tier. And what Monumental wants to do is that they want to upgrade some infrastructure like HVAC systems, how to keep the ice cold, blah, blah, blah. But one of their bigger things is that they want to restructure the bowl. So if you walk into Cap One right now, you'll notice that there's not a lot of seats down near the ice or the court, and there's a lot kind of up in the nosebleeds. And so a lot of arenas now are kind of structured the other way. There are these things called like bunker suites in in these new ones where, you know, people kind of can be closer to the action and you can charge more money. So it's basically a financial incentive that they want to restructure the bowl. And so basically they agree to split it. Monumental asked DC for $600 million of this $800 million. And DC comes back and basically says, hey, let's split it 50-50. And Ted Leonsis in our story is on the record saying, I thought we were good. The mayor and I decided to split it. And then there's this big dramatic meeting in the convention center on September 7th of last year. So let me paraphrase it and uh, tell me if I'm misunderstanding it. He expected the money up front. Uh, The mayor, because of the way the city's finances work, wanted to structure it so that it wouldn't come for a while. And she was going to do it with a tax on other businesses downtown, which Ted didn't like because he didn't want to tax other businesses. Exactly. Basically, Ted thought it would be 400, 400 split up front. And she was asking him to borrow 800 million and then they would pay off their share over time. Like the city did with Abe Poland back in the day. Right. And that strikes me as the sort of like interesting backstory here. Abe Poland, the former owner of the Capitals and the then Bullets, he built the arena himself. And at the time it was sort of heroic instead of being one of these billionaires who's like, out like tin cupping to the taxpayers for money. He built the thing himself. But that problem is that once the owns this acquired ownership, he is stuck with what he views as a rotten mortgage that he has to keep paying. Yes, he would tell you that he has the worst building deal in professional sports. And I think the contrast between Leonsis and Poland is particularly sharp in this story for a lot of reasons, like you just said. And notably, uh, my colleague Rick Mays just wrote a story about Abe Poland's son basically asking, you know, he wrote a letter to Ted Leonsis saying, like, please reconsider this decision. Please follow through on my father's legacy. You told him before he sold it to you, before he died, that, you know, you would continue to be a good partner for the city. And so I think that the stories of Abe Poland and Ted Leonsis are in sharp contrast at this point. And I got to say, after Leonsis, who's got, you know, a 20 year reputation, uh, at least in public, as the good guy of sports owners, is, I assume, not really accustomed to some of the, you know, accusations of villainy that he is getting in this case. So, meantime, he's out there, he's dissatisfied with the money part. The noise and crime are, even though he says they're not a big deal, they are. Like your colleague Eric Wemple said, they they must be wearying him. And he goes out to Virginia where he knows the governor, Glenn Youngkin, from sort of local rich guy circles. And they uh, show him Potomac Yards, the sort of open space near the airport, take him up in a nearby building under the roof where he can see the airport and the monuments and the Capitol and even the existing arena and sketch out this sort of very up-to-date future where there's an arena, but also a whole kind of entertainment district around him that will throw off even more money for him. So I think this is an important distinction because the first time Ted Leonsis goes up on top of an office building to see the site is in April. And Governor Glenn Youngkin is not in play at this point. This is Ah. strictly JBG Smith, the real estate developer, um, and some local Virginia officials because really this whole idea came about in March when a top Leonsis aide was at a a Greater Washington Partnership board meeting where the CEO of JBG Smith, Matt Kelly, is also there. And she says, hey, we're exploring other options outside of the district. And he says, I have a site that I think would fit you guys. It's Potomac Yard. And so he goes up in April. Things kind of continue to escalate throughout the spring. And it's not until mid-June that the governor gets on the phone with Ted Leonsis. And the governor told us that he was very skeptical of the deal initially, that he didn't see why Ted Leonsis would want to do this. They meet in person for the first time on July 21st. Uh, Then they have another meeting in early September. And it really picks up throughout the fall as D.C. can't get a coordinated offer together and, and that convention center meeting like we're talking about. But really... This was a J.B.G. Smith-led effort with local Virginia officials, and then Glenn Youngkin kind of comes in late to seal it. (music) 
There's a new play at Gala Theater in Columbia Heights, and this one sounds really interesting. Christina Garcia's gripping play, The Palacio Sisters, is a Latinx adaptation of Chekhov's Three Sisters, and it captures the vibrant chaos of 1985 Miami. Three sisters and their brother, who recently arrived from Havana, navigate Miami's treacherous landscape filled with drug wars and rampant violence. It's a story of challenged family bonds, resilience, and longing. Check out the world premiere in Spanish with English surtitles, also known as supertitles, at Gala Theater this month. The show is running through February 25th. For more information and tickets, visit galatheater.org. Once again, that's galatheater.org. So what was going on behind the scenes with DC here? Did they know that this footsie with Virginia was getting more serious? And what kind of offers were they putting up, if anything? So this is a subject of debate because Monumental says that they told the mayor, that Ted Leonsis told the mayor in a March meeting that they were considering an option in Virginia. Now, the mayor says she does not remember that. But according to Monumental, Two executives have notes from that meeting in which the mayor says, you don't want to go to Virginia. You don't want to go to Virginia. So it's a matter of debate of when they said it, but it's clear that they told her, you know, several months in advance. Um, And I think that what DC is doing is basically after that September 7th meeting in the convention center, when Monumental goes in thinking, okay, we have a deal. They're going to split it 50-50. We're good. And then Bonnie Mel says, oh, actually, we're not going to do our borrowing up front. DC is making a series of proposals. And I think a big thing to understand here is when Monumental is going to these different meetings, Virginia is presenting a united front with slick pitch books. It's a very professionalized operation. Um, but the governor was a, was a Carlisle Group boss. So he, he knows from making deals with fellow plutocrats. Exactly. And so a very Republican governor, a very Democratic mayor, they're in the same room in DC. The mayor and the council chairman are not on the same page, and they're not giving these offers and documents. It's, it's mostly verbal, and things are kind of unclear. At one point, I know that Monumental asks Chairman Mendelssohn and Mayor Bowser, hey, you guys like need to align your efforts. You need to get on the same page because there's too much discrepancy between these offers. But that doesn't happen until late October, early November. And by that time, I think that Ted Leonsis had picked up a lot of momentum. Governor Glenn Youngkin told us that there was a, a phone call in late October where Leonsis said, hey, I- I'd like to get this done. So this brings us back to the meeting that opens your piece, where the mayor informs uh, Leonsis, hey, we've got the money for you. We've got this worked out and goes to see him. And what happens? They walk into a conference room on the on the third floor and they're talking for about an hour about this proposal, this $500 million proposal that they get under the debt cap because of this dramatic debt refinancing, which the CFO of the city, it's a normal thing, but definitely he gets way more money than he expected. So now they can free up this $500 million. And so They're talking through this proposal and the mayor addresses basically the elephant in the room and says, hey, I've heard a rumor that you're going to be at an announcement in Virginia about a new stadium. And Ted Leonsis does a full 360 in his chair. He spins around and he hedges and he says, you know, it's not a done deal. It's not signed. But he says, yes, he will be there. And then the quote that he told the mayor is... If you had offered me this earlier, I would have accepted it. Why did he let her go on for an hour? That just seems cruel. <laughs> it's a really good question. I think it's it's very possible that he just had a hard time telling her. So all these people, the mayor, the governor, the owner of the teams, Leonsis, are all in some ways thinking about their legacies. Um, I don't know how much you guys got into this with folks, but... What's your sense of what's Leonsis' legacy going to look like if he moves the teams? What's this going to do to Bowser's or Yunkin's legacies? I think for Ted Leonsis, the legacy is, depending on how this works out in Virginia, I think that right now you have to say that his legacy is basically being the anti-A Poland, deciding to make a, a financial decision to go to Virginia and to say, you know, hey, I'm going to put what I view as, as the future of my company first and say, these are the things that are important to me and that's what I'm going to do. And just to be clear, your reporting shows this is a very good deal for his company. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And that there's it's something that sort of no big city that's already built could really ever offer, which is a, a blank slate and you can build not just the arena, but all this other stuff. It would be hard for any 
city to match that. And Virginia, I mean, $1.5 billion, it's just, it's a lot of money and, and there's a lot of things that he can do with it. He really is only contributing $400 million to this project up front in the same way that he would have had to in D.C. and he can locate all his teams. This makes a ton of financial sense for him. I think that the emotional part is the thing that he's struggling with. So can he create a great fan experience? Can he co-locate everything? I think that's going to be his legacy is what can he do there. For the mayor, it's tough for me to say. I mean, I think that she understands that uh, another mayor lost a, a sports team. And that was, you know, a pretty defining part of her legacy, you know, just in one term. But Mayor Bowser's on three terms now. So I, I think it's very different. As for Glenn Youngkin, I think this is a, a huge coup for him, particularly after the elections that they had in November. Um, I think this would be a big economic development win for him. And it reminds people, I mean, here's a guy who's kind of tried to straddle the line between being a Wall Street Republican and a Trumpy Republican. And it reminds people of the kind of deal-making thing that he ran on. Absolutely. So what is the future of this? There's now some trouble in the, in Virginia, in the, the legislature down there. It's not quite clear to me or probably to anyone else how much of that is just play acting by people seeking to improve their particular part of the deal and how much is not. But it's a weird situation where a lot of people in D.C. are rooting for like NIMBYs in Alexandria to stop the arena. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say that the current state of play here, and I'm relying on my reporting from my Virginia colleagues, Laura and Gregory and, and Teo, who are doing great work on this, and I would encourage everyone to follow them. Right now, I, I think I've had several people who aren't really tapped into the local political scene say, oh, I, I thought the Virginia thing was dead because Louise Lucas, the politician down there, has said, oh, it's dead. It's not dead. She is playing political hardball. Uh, more recently, labor organizations in Northern Virginia have come out against it, which I do think is a serious threat to the deal, particularly for Democrats being able to support this. But it's changing a lot in real time. And I think it will continue to evolve like any of these stadium deals. So I would say that the future of this is, is unclear. What happens to Leonce is if he doesn't go through with it and he's got to come back to D.C., is he, I mean, Leonce, since he's owned the teams, he's been this sort of sunny figure much loved, was benefited by the contrast with Dan Snyder, who was the very unpopular owner of the NFL team. But like Tony Kornheiser, who heard of the move as villainous. I think it was him. Does he get his good guy reputation back if they get to come back to town? I don't know. That's a good question. The fans will decide that. But I think that what does this deal look like? If Virginia falls through, if it's not possible for him to go to Virginia, how does the mayor receive him when he comes back, essentially, with his tail between his legs, right? Because I, I would be surprised if the $500 million offer were still on the table, does he evaluate going somewhere else? Does he say, okay, DC is, is it? I'm going to figure out a way to work with this mayor. Because to me, initially when he announced, Hey, we're going to make this move. The mayor adopted a very friendly approach. Hey, you know, if he comes back, we still want him. We can still change his mind. And then a couple weeks ago, she wrote an op-ed in our paper, kind of poking him in the eye and threatening litigation. And there's a whole debate about what the actual lease says. Basically, the mayor threatened litigation for what she called uh, a threat to for Leonsis to break his lease. He would say that the lease has an opt out before that. But basically, I'd be very curious to know if Virginia falls through, what does the mayor offer him? Yes, we will find out. And hopefully you'll come back and tell us, Sam. I would love that. Thank you. Well, thanks for being here, man. Of course. I always appreciate coming on the show. Hi, I'm CityCast CEO David Plotz, and I'm here with Jennifer Felix, who's the vice president of Urban Pace, which is the Mid-Atlantic's leader in new home construction for sales and marketing, and my fellow Washingtonian. So Jennifer, we're here to talk about Ebenezer Row, which is a new development of homes on Capitol Hill. And I'm intrigued by this name. Where does it come from? That's a wonderful story. It's actually uh, right next to the Ebenezer United Methodist Church, which was founded in 1838. And it was one of the first African-American congregations in the district and actually was part of the Underground Railroad. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know that. I what, know. what block is this on, on Capitol Hill exactly? This is going to be the 400 block of D Street Southeast. I used to live right around there. So what is special about that part of Capitol Hill. I lived there back in the 90s, and it's a beautiful neighborhood. And my sense is that it's just getting livelier and livelier and livelier every day. So what I like about Capitol Hill and where you are is the close proximity to Barracks Row and also to Eastern Market. Every neighborhood in D.C. has its own different feel. Capitol Hill is just a little bit more serene. There's a lot more green 
tons of various parks. Also, it's really super close if you're going to the ballpark district. That is great. And I, my understanding is like, there are so many new restaurants down there. There's a Trader Joe's down there, which is heaven. Yes. So one thing, again, about living on in the proximity to Barracks Row is how close you are to Eastern Market. And what I like about that is, yes, you do a Trader Joe's, and I'm a fan of Trader Joe's, but I also like the fact that you actually can go to the market if you're looking for something a little bit special. So you can go there and get your meat. You can go there and get, you know, your various cheeses, you know, then just go to Trader Joe's to get your crackers that you love so much with the little figs in it. What are you guys building in Ebenezer Row? The property is going to offer a total of eight condominiums, which are actually in four buildings. I'm going to say the number two a lot, but <laughs> per row home is two residences. Each residence is two levels, and each residence is going to offer you a two-bedroom, two-and-a-half bathroom. These are all a little around 1,300 interior square feet. So that's fantastic. And then we also have a fee simple townhome. This residence is also new construction. It is close to 2,500 interior square feet. It is a five bedroom, five Whoa. and a half bathroom. I know. And it's going to offer you two parking spaces. And what is the pricing like on this? The fee simple townhome would be priced at one point seven five million, and then the condominiums will be priced from eight seventy five up to just under one million. Jennifer, it's not just that these are new construction; it's also that these homes are packed with special features. You want to tell us about a couple of your favorites? Sure, absolutely. As far as the residences, one, I think it's important um, because they're two level condos, like they each have two levels, you feel like you have your own little small house. The main floor is going to offer you a powder room, which is very nice. Uh, we do have wide plank oak flooring. It's going to be a little bit more of a matte sheen to it. So that's a little bit more unique. Bathrooms are large. Of course, the primary suite is going to offer you two vanities, the walk-in showers with the frameless glass. Um, we also are very generous on our closet size, which is hard to find Ooh. in Capitol Hill. And also our ceiling height is nice and tall, including on the upper level. Um, so you're going to be dealing with nine-foot ceilings throughout. Oh, and then also most importantly is the kitchen, which, as we know, is the heart of the home. We're doing induction cooking. Love which, it. Love it. Yeah, we're excited about it. So induction cooking, for those that are not familiar, that are listening, it is, one, environmentally friendly. Two, it's incredibly fast. And it's also more of an even cook than you're going to have from gas. Most chefs actually would prefer to cook on induction versus gas cooking. The only thing that you need to do as a consumer is buy some pans with enough metal in it, which is a lovely housewarming gift. In addition to that, um, our appliances are a little bit different. Tip of what we've been seeing more and more in the market is Thermador, and we're actually doing Gen Air, which is a level up. All of our cabinetry is custom by JSUS. Um, you're also going to have the quartz countertop, which of course is going to waterfall. All the kitchen islands are quite long, which is nice, built-in trash, et cetera. We're, of course, doing rings as far as for your smart homes. So they're done very well as far as just kind of how you're going to live and the property and how it lends itself. Jennifer Felix of Urban Pace, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me today. Again, check out EbenezerRow.com to learn more. That's E-B-E-N-E-Z-E-R-Row.com. Gosh, that's satisfying to say. We'll have the link for you in our show notes as well to make it nice and easy for you to find. And that is all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, tell your friends about it and you don't have to tell them while you're letting them down on a big piece of financial news. And check out the show notes for more information on Ebenezer Homes. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.